Welcome to the Naturally Healthy Pets podcast. Let's get to it. Thank you so much for tuning in. This week, my guest is none other than the famous Dr. Karen Becker. If you haven't heard who Dr. Becker is, you've been hiding under a rock because (laughs) Karen, I think everybody knows you worldwide. (laughs) But thank you so much for agreeing to be on our show. (laughs) Oh, well, you know, Judy, uh, you have so kindly, graciously, we've done many podcasts on my (laughs) platforms Thank you for inviting me. And for me, it's all about scheduling. So I appreciate your amazing team when I'm like, hey, give me six months and they work with that, which is really nice. So thank you for having me. It is weird that we have to schedule things six months out, but we're finding that just with so many things because we are all crazy busy, but I think we are making huge impacts in the world. So, Mm. and it's a team effort. So um, yeah, yeah, no problem. So um, for those of you who, may have been hiding under that rock. Veterinarian and wildlife biologist Dr. Karen Shaw Becker believes that biologically appropriate food, yay, and an animal's immediate environment are the most important factors in determining health, vitality, and lifespan. She has spent her career as a small animal clinician empowering animal guardians to make intentional lifestyle decisions to enhance the well-being of their animals. And isn't that what we all want? Mm. So, uh, and today we are actually going to talk about what you should know prior to desexing your dog. So we actually did, um, with our team, we did a whole focus week on, um, spay, neuter, alternatives, reasons why you should or shouldn't, or maybe why we should rethink things. And so I know this is something that Dr. Becker has looked at very extensively. Uh, Part of it was for the Forever Dog book, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Most recently, that is when I did my second kind of dive into <laughs> the the bigger, deeper, more profound side effects that have that research has demonstrated. Yes, for sure. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's like so many things in veterinary medicine. It, it, a trend starts or a statement is made and it's sort of like, well, this is just how we've always done it. And so Mm -hmm. this is how we're always going to do it. And I, for so many years in practice, parroted the exact same Mm -hmm. thing that I learned in veterinary school back in the early 1980s. So yeah, I'm a little bit old. Um, But uh, it was spay and neuter at six months before they come into heat that, you know, that way we don't have to worry about them ever getting bred. You don't have to deal with the mess of them being in heat or your cats, you know, cat are walling and rolling around your house. And um, it just became sort of the mantra. Mm-hmm. And it was just, this is just how we do it. And Kara, what, what do you think brought about the first studies on why we <laughs> maybe we want to look at doing something differently? <laughs> Yeah, such a good question. That was the question that I set out to answer when I wrote Forever Dog in 2000. So I wrote Forever Dog during the pandemic, which was a fantastic thing to do when you're sitting yeah. around stressed <laughs> out. It's like at home, pacing around, I might as well ch- channel that time for something good. So I did do a deeper dive into where the actual techniques got established for conventional spay and neuter, meaning the you know, uh, ovary hysterectomy, removing the uterus and the ovaries of a female and removing the testicles of a male. Like what? Where did that get started? And it was my alma mater, which made it easy to actually call and have conversations with uh, not just the surgery department, but some of the old timers that were originally the professors at Iowa State University College of Veterinary Medicine, where they developed this initial spay-neuter technique. And I find it interesting when I was able to track down some of the old timers that were friends with the people that set some of these protocols, the original technique and the quote that I got was, well, if you're going to make a big incision and have them under anesthesia, you might as well, you might as well remove all the tissue that could be problematic either at that time or going forward. So as long as you have them open, you might as well take it out. And my thought was, holy cow. Yeah. (laughs) And, you know, we're talking early 1900s when they set some of these protocols and they're like, you know, it's open, just yank everything out. And at that time, they didn't know, they didn't realize that every organ has a purpose and that there is Uh. a web effect of when you remove one, there's this chain reaction of other things happening in the body. They just didn't know. So in, in our profession's defense early on, they didn't know. But I guess now, Dr. Morgan, you have to feel like I do. We do know. And so my frustration now is that 
we have this mounting evidence of really provocative research, a growing body of research. And our profession, I feel it's a little bit like the ultra processed pet food industry. They're just, I don't want to say choosing to look elsewhere because we're not taught how to do alternative techniques. Vets don't know what to say. And therefore they're still parroting the ancient thing that we learned in vet school, which is yank everything out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, if, if we looked at yank out everything that could be problematic, well, while we're there, let's just take out their spleen. Yep. And it's sort of like people with large breed dogs who are like, well, while we're there, we'll tack their stomach in place. It's like, yeah. well, how many things do we want to do? And how many of those body parts might be necessary down the line? Right, <laughs> like, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, we, we, we see kind of similar things in human medicine. I'll never forget. I worked at emergency medicine for 10 years and the owner of this big clinic, uh, he had some blood dyscrasias and they couldn't tell if it was a bone marrow problem or where it was coming from. And so he had an enlarged spleen and they said, well, we should remove your spleen. Okay. This was back in the late 1980s. And he almost had his spleen removed. And then at the last minute, they finally figured out his spleen was big because it was the only thing making blood for him. Yep. If they had removed his spleen, he was a dead man. Yep. It's like, maybe we should look at things <laughs> A little yeah. more critically before yeah. we jump in here. So yeah. So let's um let's talk about some of the things that we now know. Like we know that we need the sex hormones to 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 make puppies and kittens, which yay, that's wonderful. But they do other things. Can you talk about some of the other things that we now know these hormones are responsible for? Well, and absolutely. And I think that that goes back to, I don't know how and when kind of you started connecting the dots, but for me, I was raised working at a kill shelter. I was a euthanasia technician at 17, oh. certified through, I went to euthanasia school at my alma mater when I was 17. So I came from a background of a lot of emotional damage, but also dealing primarily with super irresponsible human beings that had litter after litter. So I, gra I graduated vet school with that kind of as my base, meaning I graduated obsessing about making sure that I yanked everything out before six months yeah. of age. So I had Ugh. inadvertently, I set up my practice in 1999. By 2003, I was already seeing the unhealthy fruits of my focused labor of making sure everything was not just sterilized in my practice, but making sure that they were de-sexed because at that time I didn't even realize that there was an option for alternative right. surgical techniques. So it was around 2006, Judy, that for those initial research studies, Cornell had already released the hip dysplasia correlation. Texas Tech had already released the CCL, ACL, torn ligament. Uh, the golden retriever study came demonstrating hypothyroidism correlation. All those things were kind of circa 2006, but it was then when the studies on mast cell tumors, lymphoma, as well as hemangiosarcoma, there was some rumblings in the literature about those particular cancers being correlated to early spay neuter, as well as the big one for me, I graduated telling everyone I knew, if you neuter your dog, you'll prevent prostate cancer. And it was 2002 <laughs> that we know actually the study came out demonstrating that there's a fourfold increase in prostatic cancers if you have a neuter dog. So it was 2006 when I kind of had my own little professional meltdown. And I, <laughs> and part of this came about because I see exotics. So I started seeing all my ferret patients. We, we spay and neuter ferrets at three weeks of age. So okay. all my ferrets get insulinomas. They all have insulin issues, pancreatic tumors. They all become diabetic, hypothyroid, and as well as adrenal issues. But then I started seeing this in my dog. So it was through my exotic animal practice that I was like, you know what? All of my ferrets that are now dying of metabolic endocrine diseases are looking a lot like my midlife dogs that I desexed at six months or before. So that's mm. when I made the call to Dr. Jack Oliver. He at that time had set up the Tennessee, the veterinary school adrenal lab, the endocrine lab at University of Tennessee. That's awesome school. there. Amazing. And he really became my endocrine mentor <clears throat> until his sudden death, unfortunately, six years later. But during that time frame, basically I said, listen, Jack, I'm seeing these things in ferrets. And I believe I'm, I'm seeing them in dogs, but it's not like no one's talking about this. If I start sending you blood samples that look at endocrine panels, can we start a discussion? And he gave me a massive discount. And instead of running a traditional thyroid or adrenal test, I sent everything for a full adrenal panel and thyroid panel, a nice. full endocrine panel through Tennessee. That six years body of evidence was 
overwhelming to me enough that I had to open my mouth and start talking about it. And so it was at that time that I made that video, got over a million views where I basically just spilled my heart and said, Hey, listen, I am seeing something as a solo, as an N of one. I'm me as a veterinarian. (laughs) I'm seeing stuff out there that I just want to talk about. And Holy, Holy hellfire rained down on me for making that video. (laughs) How dare you? I could do that video now. And I think I have some professional colleagues that would be like, oh yeah, you know, there is something going on. But 2012, everyone's like, what the hell are you doing? And all of these letters you're going to cause. And so I just want to be clear for anyone listening to your podcast that we are, (laughs) neither one of us are talking about irresponsible breeding. If we are going to sterilize, we're talking about sterilization. So the prevention of unwanted litters without damaging the hormone producing tissues. So t- this is a long winded answer to your question, but what this comes <laughs> down to Judy is the recognition of, of luteinizing hormones. So back then we, we, I think all of us holistic practitioners, were starting to see stuff, thyroidy dogs, adrenal dogs, fat dogs, overweight dogs, stuff that were like, Hey, something's going on metabolically. What could it be? <clears throat> well, it was at this same time that our awesome colleague, Michelle Cutzler, who's a DVM, and a PhD and a board certified theriogenologist. She studied, she started making this like her passion for research. And so at that point we knew, yeah, some cancers, yeah, thyroid, adrenal, yeah, tendon ligament, but I'm just going to read to you since 2012, Dr. Kutzler, let me tell you what she has, what her research has shown. And the reason I have to read it is I'm over 50 and I can't remember the list, but listen to (laughs) what she has correlated. There are bona fide research papers demonstrating that eliminating sex hormones increases the incidence of obesity, urinary incontinence, urinary calculi, bladder stones, atopic dermatitis, allergies, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and thrombocytopenia, adrenal disease, thyroid disease, diabetes, IBD, hip dysplasia, CCL rupture, cognitive dysfunction, and several types of cancers, prostate, bladder, lymph, mast cell, and bone cancer, as well as aggressive and fearful behavior and growth plate issues for large and giant breed dogs. That's her list based on her research. And at that point it was like, oh my gosh, like we have, we need to stop and have a professional conversation about this. Yeah. And what she found is exactly what you stated that we thought the only tissues, let me back up and say, what she discovered. She discovered that when dogs go through puberty, the signal for puberty is the pituitary releases luteinizing hormone from the pituitary that tells the ovaries and the testes time to start producing some That's sex hormones, roll. right? That's right. It's time. <laughs> we're we're going to start producing some sex hormones. And it's the stimulus LH is what we call it. Instead of luteinizing hormone, LH is the stimulus to tell the body we're going to go through puberty. Let's go. When we remove sex organs that have those LH receptors, the pituitary, you know, six months of age starts releasing some LH and then the body's not getting the message because we took those glands out. And so then the pituitary says, okay, I'm going to release more LH and then more LH and more LH to the point that actually our dog's bodies become toxic with LH. Well, here's the answer to your question. We thought, Michelle Kutzler thought, that maybe only ovaries and testes had those LH receptors. And the truth is, Every cell of our dog's bodies have an LH receptor, but particularly adrenal, thyroid, bladder, lymphocytes. So we've got some key tissues that are absorbing massive amounts of toxic levels of LH. And for those of you listening, saying, well, how did that whole long list of like diseases happen? Dr. Cutzler is beginning to knit together that it's this excessive LH hormone that is doing the damage. So every cell of our animal's body has this receptor. So then it begs the question, well, then where is my dog's body potentially going to break? Which means where are those symptoms going to come about? And we're all looking at each other at this point, comparing notes. Yeah. I, you know, and it's interesting because I'm not a researcher. I'm not a research based person, but Early on in practice, and so one of the things that we know now is that all the different glands, so the pancreas, the thyroid, the thymus, the the pituitary, the the ovaries, the testes, they're all part of a system. It's the endocrine system. And they don't each have their own sandbox that they only play in. Like they all 
play together. And when one of them is affected, then we see this cascade of problems. And so why are we seeing so much Cushing's that, you know, that's the adrenal glands? Why are we, and more Addison's we're seeing now, actually, why are we seeing more hypothyroidism? Why are we seeing, um, you know, more of these issues, pancreatitis, uh, diabetes, why are we seeing, because the endocrine system is just like, well, wait, half of us is missing. Yeah. <laughs> like we don't know what to do because our sandboxes have to play together. Yeah. Um, so on that note, we need to take a quick break. And when we come back, uh, we're going to talk some more about uh, other options that are available, other things that still happen within the body. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Have you had a chance to read Dr. Judy's best-selling book, Raising Naturally Healthy Pets, A Guide to Helping Your Pets Live Longer? Whether you adopt or shop, choosing the right pet for your family is a decision that should be made after careful consideration. Once that pet enters your home, what's next? Are you going to vaccinate? What about parasite prevention? Or choosing the best diet for your new addition? Dr. Judy answers these questions and more in this easy to read book for pet parents. As a podcast listener, you can enjoy 20% off Raising Naturally Healthy Pets by Dr. Judy Morgan using the code PODCAST11 at naturallyhealthypets.com. All right, welcome back. We've been talking about uh, some great research and some great researchers that are have been kind of in Karen's circle of friends, which is great. I, I love that you reach out to people who are kind of at that upper level echelon um, and and really ask pertinent questions so that we need to know because we don't know. And we have to educate pet parents because like you said, so many traditional veterinarians are still stuck in the six months, everybody, that's it. Um, so uh, what other diseases are you seeing associated with the traditional spay neuter? I have seen, probably just like you have seen, that entire list that Dr. Cutzler has rattled off. But for me, clinically, it initially manifests as metabolic disease. So step one, the first year out, it's potentially harder to maintain your dog's body weight. You have to cut their calories way back. And what we are learning now with AFCO regulations is if you cut, if you feed less than recommended on the bag, you're probably, a, you're, you are. If your if your pet food is formulated according to AFCO, you are depriving your animals minimum nutrient requirements. And so by reducing food, you are reducing nutrients. And then there's an interplay there. The second year after neuter, I am seeing more skin and hair coat, not only the increased incidence of atopy, itchy dogs, but the thyroid adrenal thing kicking in. And you are seeing this too. The adrenal either goes into burnout and then failure or becomes ramped up. And if you think about it, those little adrenal glands, the only place left that there could produce any sex hormones in the entire body is in the adrenal glands. So when we desex dogs early on, those little adrenals, which are teeny tiny, there's a size of peas at the top of our dog's kidney. Yeah. They were not meant to take the place of testes or ovaries, but they try. God bless them. And they fail. Yeah. And in failure, they either <laughs> overproduce cortisol and we get a Cushing's dog, or they just say, I can't do it. And they quit producing any type of cortisol. And then you have an adisoding a patient. But in between there, you have this year of adrenal burnout where there's just low energy, fatigue, exercise intolerance, uh, depression, behavior changes, significant yeah. behavior changes with spayed and neutered animals. So initially I'm seeing those types of more metabolic issues, but then along comes the, so the soft tissue, the musculoskeletal issues. And last and the most painful would be immune failure issues pertaining to increased incidence of cancer. Yeah. Which is just, just awful. Devastating. Awful. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, you had stated in some notes that were sent that UC Davis, uh, recently pr produced some peer reviewed studies. Um, and what did they confirm in their studies? So actually there's several different veterinary schools now doing research 
within certain spheres, or for instance, the golden retriever, they're studying specific types of metabolic changes or physiologic changes within specific categories of dogs. And I still find it interesting, you know, let me just backtrack. And, and so the UC Davis study confirmed exactly what Dr. Kutzer has found, that indeed there are irreversible changes that play into dogs. That we're not talking about kitties here, thank goodness, but dogs can have irreversible changes pertaining to immune, metabolic, hormone, hormonal and musculoskeletal, their physiology can be permanently changed depending on the age that desexing occurred. And it is nice that we have different institutions now confirming research. It is a little frustrating. The, the Visla study, I believe came out in 2008 and the Visla study, 2,500 dogs demonstrating that anxiety, thunderstorm phobia, and aggression, as well as fear-based behaviors all increased with early spay neuter. But I probably the biggest criticism I had criticism I had from my colleagues with people saying, "Well, those are Vislas." Well, kind of, I, I've also had that with the Rottweiler osteosarcoma study. People oh. say, "Well, those are Rotties," and it's true. We haven't studied every breed with every type of metabolic physiologic dyscrasia going on, but we also can't. Veterinary medicine doesn't have that type of funding. So in essence, yeah. we are, Judy, still knitting together a variety, thank goodness, around the world of veterinary hospitals, all around the world, as well as veterinary teaching institutions, private individuals raising money to do some of these studies, mostly correlated with breed clubs. They're looking at these incidences yeah. of certain breeds carrying trending disease and degenerative, degenerative conditions that they are beginning to assume could be linked to spay and neuter. So a lot of this research is being funded specifically by breed clubs saying, hey, we are seeing hemangiosarcoma represented at a higher level. We're seeing osteosarcoma represented at a higher level than other breeds. Could it be correlated to early spay neuter? My frustration is that certainly certain breeds have certain predispositions, but all breeds require some sex hormones, just like our bodies. Yeah. We need all breeds would benefit from a little bit of sex hormones before we up and remove everything. So we can't answer all the questions that everyone has. And certainly I, I, my brain swirls with questions, but I believe at this point, we know enough to make wiser recommendations as veterinarians. Yeah, I agree. And I saw one major article in a major veterinary publication where they were, t they actually listed out like 30 or 40 different breeds and said, and, and actually gave a timeline for the ideal time yes. to spay and neuter. Yes. And, um, the, my take home from that whole thing was just as a, as a whole with the larger breeds, they were definitely saying, oh, well, you know, because we've got the golden retriever study and the Rottweiler study and that, you know, with larger breeds, yes, maybe leaving the sex hormones there a longer is going to be beneficial for the smaller breeds. It really doesn't matter. Well, doesn't the, the hormonal system in the body function that, I mean, maybe, maybe the smaller breeds are not as prone to osteosarcoma or hemangiosarcoma, although I am seeing more and more hemangio in small breeds, which is scary. Um, but I don't, I don't know that we can make a statement that says, if you have a small breed dog, go ahead and spay and neuter at six months. I think partly, so the paper that you're referring to basically was a, a summary, a really nice recap of knitting all the science we have thus far, but thus far it's usually pertaining to certain breeds. So all we can do is kind of gather this, the, uh, the data that we have and put it together saying, well, this breed falls into large breed. So let's look at what, tr what is trending there. I think generally speaking, most veterinarians would agree that small, that chihuahuas, you know, tend to mature faster compared to, let's say, a Tibetan Mastiff, which it may take two years for a Tibetan Mastiff to come into heat. And we know that sometimes little chihuahuas are running around the house humping, wanting to have sex at four months of age. So I think generally <laughs> speaking, what that paper insinuated was that smaller breed dogs mature faster and because they are maturing faster, they may come into heat faster and or become skeletally mature. They become adults faster than large and diet, giant breed dogs. So we would be able to desex them sooner than dogs that potentially don't come into heat or begin receiving that LH stimulus until one, one and a half or two years of age. And I understand where that paper was coming from, but I completely agree with you to say that we can early detect, desex all small breed dogs 
give that 10 years and then we'll have an independent body of research pertaining to what we've done to small dogs, where if I believe, I believe <laughs> we can avoid that if we use logic and common sense. So, uh, one of the, um, the big things, because we talked a lot and I'm not going to go into detail, but we talked about doing vasectomies on the male dogs where basically we, we cut the tube that carries the sperm from where they're produced to get outside to get to the female. So, you know, pretty simple surgery. We actually had our uh, veterinarian that we're using do her very first vasectomy on my daughter Gwen's dog. Nice. She agreed. She let us film the whole thing. She's like, sure, if you want me to use your dog as my guinea pig. And I'm like, well, look, you got to start somewhere. So, I mean, it was awesome. Um, but then doing either tubal ligations in our females or ovary sparing spay where we remove the uterus and leave the ovaries. Um, there's also a, a, a surgery where you can remove the ovaries and leave the uterus. That one really, uh, sorry, where you remove the ovaries and leave the uterus. And that one doesn't really make sense to me because the ovaries are producing the hormones that we want. So anyway, but there's a, a few different ways that we can approach this. Um, but why is none of that taught in veterinary school? And do you think it's going to change? Such a good question. I... I'm trying to, I'm starting with my alma mater because they were the one that invented this kind of, <laughs> Good. right? So I, so we can blame it on them and say, now you need to fix it. <laughs> so I kind of am. Uh, I went back last fall and I had a conversation uh, with the head of the small animal surgery department. And I don't know, I can't say why it's slow. What I put, what I pitched and what my proposal would be is it would be very easy to teach third or fourth year surgical students when they're both learning. And then when they're practicing, it would be very easy to teach. Here's a traditional desexing surgery. Here's a vasectomy surgery. And here's an ovary sparing spay, which is another term for hysterectomy. So in theory, hysterectomy and vasectomy, less time under anesthesia, which means you're saving money, smaller incision. You can do two procedures to every one traditional spay and neuter. Like there's a bunch of reasons why we should be teaching this, not to mention that we have pet parents around the world saying, I really would like this. And the, the graduate, and not to mention it's better for the animals, but you know what? Whatever. I mean, we can factor all that in and say, is there a reason why you're not teaching these al alternative sterilization techniques? And the institutions I have contacted more than just ISU, but the institutions that even Parsimas foundation, which is parsimas.org is the, is the place that your listeners can go to, to find a veterinarian who offers different surgical techniques, whether it's vasectomy or hysterectomy, you can go to parsimus.org and you can find a list of vets. And that's so awesome that your vet was open to doing this and doing the research. <laughs> that, she must be amazing. So God bless her for saying sure. And then also to film it. The first time, you know what I practice on? I, I, I found dead raccoons driving to and from work. And I did my first vasectomies on roadkill because I'm not going to, I'm not, I was, I would be way too chicken to have a beautiful client and say, Hey, let me practice vasectomy. So I did it on roadkill. <laughs> It was awful. And, and here's a veterinarian looking over yes, your shoulder. Yes. <laughs> so your veterinarian is amazing. Uh, but for people that yes. don't have access to her, then you can go to parsimus.org and find a veterinarian that offers these techniques. The biggest pushback I'm getting from veterinary schools, which I find really shocking, and this is kind of a push for your listeners and readers to call your state or wherever your closest veterinary school is, is that around the country, they're saying, we're not seeing a need for it. We have not been alerted to a need for teaching an alternative surgical Ugh. technique. So apparently we're not loud enough yet is what they're saying. Yet. Yet. Okay. Yeah. Well, just, we'll, we'll keep jumping on this bandwagon. Yes. So uh, I'm sure that most people that are listening, sadly, uh, with, you know, especially if you go to adopt an animal, they're going to come yes. to you already spayed or neutered and some of them at six or eight weeks, which is just so sad. Um, so what can people do if their animal, and I get this question all the time, what do they do if their animal was spayed mm -hmm. or neutered early? Um, or, and even if it wasn't before six months, but let's say it was before 12 months, um, in my practice in the, probably the last 10 years in practice, uh, we were definitely spaying and neutering later. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of like, where is for the, for the males, I was like, why don't we just leave them intact? Uh, you know, as long as people are handling them and blah, blah. Um, 
And for the females, we were sort of like, well, there's a sweet spot here somewhere mm-hmm. uh, because everybody gets worried about mammary cancer, which that's sort of been debunked. But um, and then people worry about pyometra, certainly understandable. So we were kind of trying to find that sweet spot, yeah. depending on the size of the dog and their maturity level. And it's like, oh, well, maybe 18 months, 24, but let's let them go through a couple of heat cycles. Anyway, so but once somebody has their animal dissect, dissect, is there anything they can yeah. do to try to help these animals function? Yeah, there, there's a lot that you can do. In fact, I have a whole six to eight hour webinar on what you can do because, as you know, Judy, it, dep- it depends wow. on where the body breaks. So if your animal is in adrenal, is beginning stages of adrenal failure, that's one protocol. If they're fulminantly out of sodium, it's another. If they're cushionoid, it's another. But what I would tell everyone listening is that there's some basic things we can do. If your animal that has no symptoms right now, there are some basic things we can do. Now, if your animal's symptomatic, where we would support them is where their innate physiology broke. So if you have a giant breed dog, support the hips, support those CCL, support the, you know, support the knee ligaments, support a healthy body weight. Exercise actually is really important. And so yeah. the two factors we know from the literature is that LH, this toxically high hormone that, that we would like to decrease is on a seesaw with dopamine. So what we want to do for generally speaking is we want to tr- do what we can to bring LH down because it's at toxic levels and to increase dopamine. And interestingly, you probably have seen this too, spayed and neutered animals, because they innately all have lower dopamine, you can see kind of like this midlife blase neutral, like working dogs <laughs> quit wanting to work. Dogs become, I've had my clients say they're depressed or they act like they have fibromyalgia. They, they act like they don't feel good. And yet that that's hard to kind of explain. But when you understand that they're not producing adequate dopamine because LH suppresses dopamine, it's like, okay, it's hard to have an amazingly great day when you have no dopamine, right? So things we right. can do to increase dopamine at exercise is a good freebie. A tyrosine rich foods like meat based diet and eggs, some of the richest foods in tyrosine, getting your animals off of carbs, carbs, the, when I say carb, those refined white flour, sugary carbs, the high starches actually feed insulin. And we know that one of the best ways to help control LH is to get, keep insulin low and steady. It's hard to keep insulin low when you're feeding a bunch of carbs. So Focus on minimizing insulin, maintaining body weight, focus on meat-based foods that have a lot of tyrosine, which is necessary for dopamine production. Actually, bizarrely, fava beans, fava beans, for whatever reason, have <laughs> dopamine precursors. And so I was, I, I went digging probably six years ago on what food specifically could help um, support dopamine production. Fava beans are there. Now, don't go crazy with fava beans, but you know, you can add a good 5% fava beans. It, like training treats, they're awesome. You feed them cooked but has some dopamine precursors and believe it or not, curcumin, curcumin actually helps to bring Mm -hmm. down LH as well. Now where this research came from is not from dogs, Judy. It came from women that have polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS women that have polycystic ovarian problems also have very high LH. So we look at what they're doing to bring LH down into normal range. And then I'm just applying it to dogs. And I've seen pretty darn good success over the last 20 years of, of doing this. Glandular therapy is awesome. Glandular therapy, feeding desiccated organs back to animals that have dysfunctional or missing organs is a grand idea. And so using glandular products, I absolutely love. You can also do dogosterone, which is a a, a CE, a continuing education program where your veterinarian uh, has to sign up, watch a class online, and then they can do basically hormone replacement therapy. And I do use hormone replacement therapy in many of my cases. But in essence, you have to match what you're seeing with, a, with your patient, with what the protocol is. So if it's skin and coat, you're going to increase those omegas. You're going to work on increasing DHA and EPA, which also has a, a tie-in. But honestly, one of the best supplements we could ever give is inositol. And inositol, it's also called, called vitamin B8. It's also called IP6 or uh, hexaphosphate. Mm-hmm. IP6, AKA myo inositol actually is one of the biggest things we can do to bring LH down in the body. And so I use a lot of IP6 in my practice for animals who we know, let's say had early spay neuter, but are two to three and are not yet exhibiting anything. IP6 is a really nice supplement that you can use for a lifetime that helps 
within reason, minimize the amount of LH so circulating around the body. So the key is be astute for changes. If you rescue a dog that has been desexed, look for behavior and physical changes. And then the second you see those changes, be proactive and address them. For animals that have been desexed at eight weeks of age and that have no symptoms, glandular therapy, a fresh food diet that is low starch and uh, lots of exercise, lots of sniffaris to keep dopamine high, fava beans, meat-based diet, and some inositol is a really good starting protocol. That's amazing. Yeah, I used to use IP6 a lot for my cancer cases. And so, yeah, so this makes perfect sense, you know, with what we are, are, are trying to accomplish. Uh, we are out of time. I could I could literally sit here and talk to you for about 10 hours. But uh, where can people find more information about Dr. Karen Becker for anybody who's been under uh, that rock? At <laughs> drkarenbecker.com. There you go. So simple. <laughs> we appreciate mm. everything that you do, Karen. You are amazing. Mm. You are such a gift to the pet world and, and actually the wildlife too, because I know that's a passion of yours. Uh, keep up the good work. And um, I love watching your travels around the world and seeing where you're off to next to celebrate birthday parties and do research. And it's just amazing. So thank you very much for being a guest and keep Keep on doing Thank what you're you. doing. Thank you. And much love to you and everything you are doing. I think together, I think all of us working in our own lanes and doing what we do ultimately makes our mission of doing everything we can to empower pet owners to make better decisions. We're all in our own lanes doing it. But when we come together, we're making a big dent in the world when it comes to intentionally creating good quality of life. So I appreciate everything you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to another great Naturally Healthy Pets episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for some helpful links. And if you enjoy the show, please be sure to follow and listen for free on your favorite podcast app. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you on how we're doing. Visit drjudymorgan.com for healthy product recommendations, comprehensive courses, upcoming events, and other fantastic resources. Until next time, keep giving your pet the vibrant life they deserve. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. It is no substitute for professional care by a veterinarian, licensed nutritionist, or other qualified professional. You're encouraged to do your own research and should not rely on this information as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Dr. Judy and her guests express their own views, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets neither endorses or opposes any particular view discussed here.